Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the penultimate of the shows I'm doing before I go off to the We Have Ways Festival over the weekend with James Holland and all those other merry historians will be there. My guest today is renowned historian Roger Morehouse, bringing us the subject of his latest book, The Forgers. Now, imagine I'm holding up a copy, but my copy hasn't actually arrived in the post yet. It's bound to arrive tomorrow, but you can find the links to purchase it in the description below, or you can buy it wherever books are, are sold. So I'm going to bring in Roger now. So good evening, Roger. You've got your copy, though. So there we are. There you go. How's that? Brilliant there stuff. So, um, for people who don't know this subject, because it, you know, they've obviously read the description on YouTube there. But you know, if I'm doing a show about Operation Market Garden or Midway or something, people have got that frame of reference. So, imagine Roger, you're sitting in front of Steven Spielberg or Tom Hanks or or HBO or something. You've got to pitch them the story for the Forgers, and you've got a minute because Steven yeah. Spielberg has got another person waiting outside. How would you explain the story? Well, it's a, it's completely new. I mean, that's that's one of the one of the key things of this. It's completely new. It wasn't really known about um, even five years ago. Um, it's a story of a Holocaust rescue operation that's uh, under, undertaken from uh, Switzerland, from the comparative safety of Switzerland, by uh, Polish diplomats in concert with Jewish activists called the Wadosh Group together. Uh, Wadosh being the name of the uh, the Polish ambassador. So it, it ran out of the Polish embassy in Bern in Switzerland. Um, and what they were doing was uh, forging or illegally producing Latin American passports, which were then smuggled into occupied Poland and also into occupied Holland, but mainly Poland. Um, and they effectively saved um, large numbers of Jews from the Holocaust because it sort of put a put a, a spanner in the works of the of the um, mechanism of the Holocaust, if you like, because it made those the recipients of those passports. It made them. Um, legal legal entities again. Part of the part of the Holocaust was that it it sort of created non people out of the out yeah. of its victims before it actually killed them, or before the Germans killed them. So this kind of put a spoke in the wheel of that sort of um, uh, delegalization process by giving them these sort of faked Paraguayan passports. And it's the story of that. It's the story of the the sort of diplomatic and political wrestles around it as well. Um, and it's at the end. It's it's basically about those. About, I reckon about 10,000 people received these passports, which is a huge number. And it's about them trying to survive in, in the still within the camp system in Germany as what were known as exchange Jews mm. um, for the last sort of two years of the war. And it's and it's a, a, in many ways a gruesome story, which will be quite familiar to many of us from, from reading about the Holocaust. But also within that, there's sort of there's tremendous sort of flashes of of humanity in it as well, not only because of those six individuals trying to do the right thing, but also among the victims, you know, um, those who, and survivors, those, they, they still live and love and laugh. And there's a, a tremendous wealth of accounts that I've been able to, to bring, to bring to, to, to the fore here. And it gives it a lovely sort of human element as well. So I wanted to write something about the Holocaust, but I wanted it to be something new. Uh, and this gave me the opportunity to do that. And I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic story. Well, brilliant. Um, well put. And the thing about telling the Holocaust story, we've talked about on this channel, and you must have talked about it before, and you you travelled to Poland a, a bit, you were saying before going live, you're a bit of a kind of rock star in Poland in terms of World War II history, is the Holocaust, when you get to the, the big end of it, the numbers are just staggering, and it's very hard to relate to it. It's, it's back to yeah. the analogy of, of Spielberg using the little girl in the red coat in Schindler's List to kind of yeah. follow one person, because you can kind of take that on board, but you can't take on board the concept of millions. Mm. And you know, we'll talk about more about the story of, of the Forders as we go on. But one of the things that comes up, when I, I've, I've touched, Prick was on a few weeks ago, and we talked about some of the people in Lithuania who were helping uh, some people escape the Holocaust there, you know, Catholic priests and people like that. And, and the comments were, this is all very well, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drop in the ocean. You know, far more people were swept up and yeah. killed by the Holocaust than the comparative small numbers of people who, who were saved. And so therefore, is it, is it really fair to talk about these smaller stories of survival when actually the bigger picture is lots of people being killed? So how would you address that that comment initially in, in the fact that yeah. you, know, you are talking about a small part of this? Yeah, I, th I mean, I can see that point. Um, but I think the there's two points to in response to that. And one of which is I think that this story in particular um, actually illuminates quite a lot of wider aspects of Holocaust history. Um, not least, you know, the, the sort of big questions like, you know, what did we know? When did we know it? And what did we do about it? As in mm. the 
world. Um, and all those are still very, very pertinent questions. And just boiling down this, uh, this story to a sort of an ana analysis of, of pure figures, as in how many people did it enable to survive, is, is I think a little bit reductionist because there's a lot more going on in this story in terms of that international reaction, in terms of the, the diplomatic wrestle around it, um, that is very significant. And that's stuff that we, we do kind of need to know about. And it actually, there's a bit of myth busting in there as well, because I think there's an element where we traditionally uh, look back at that period of history and we look, we look back at the Western response and we imagine, I think, often quite lazily and so, sort of in a quite self-congratulatory manner, that the outside world was sort of waiting to help, but was was hindered in doing that by, you know, knowledge of what was going on, by logistics, by the wider war and all that sort of thing. And actually, when you when you look at this story, you know, this was a, a scheme that the outside world could have got behind, and they could have they could have pressured the Germans to to have recognized more of those passports or pressured the, the, the Paraguayans particularly to recognize those passports. And then the Germans would have saved, allowed more people to survive. So this is a, a really key example where the West actually failed to do that mm. for various reasons. I mean, we can come on to that later on, but uh, this is what I mean, that it really illuminates much wider and much more pertinent questions than just one purely of numbers. And then the second point I'd say in, in response to that, is there's a great line from the Talmud which says, you know, he who saves one life saves yeah. the world entire. And that's a that's a very sort of, I think, a very humane approach that, um, you know, what, what are we saying? That it, because they only saved, you know, we, we estimate about 2,000 people. We know about 800 plus that survived on these passports. But if they only saved, for example, two or 3,000 people, which is the, what the estimate is, does that, you know, should they not have bothered? I mean, I think there's a lot of, there's thousands of people alive now in the world who wouldn't otherwise have been alive other, other except for these passports you're going to tell them that they shouldn't have bothered you know so yeah. it's a you know it's a quite reductionist way of looking at it to be honest no i i, I agree i was putting it out there because it's one of those things that always comes up people go you know yeah. isn't, isn't it you know just a bit um not not i can't think of the right word there but you know you're, you're highlighting a small story as a part of a, of a bigger story but yes. let's get back to the subject of the book and the forges because as soon as I think of forgers, there, there I am thinking of Donald Pleasance in The Great Escape, you know, forging individual passes. But we're talking about something on a, on a much, not much, but a, a, a fairly more substantial scale. So, yeah. so uh, and we've already had the question coming in from Terry Emery is, is why Paraguay uh, and mm. or Latin America? So perhaps we can address that question. And, and what, what is what is forgery? How, how, in, how is how industrial is this, this setup? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so working out of um, Switzerland, uh, working out the Polish embassy, um, it, the development of it is very organic. And that actually goes back to the, the example that had been set by um, a Japanese consul in Lithuania. You mentioned Lithuania earlier on, um, whose name was Kiyuna Sugihara. Um, and he was actually in touch with and collaborated with Polish intelligence um, in 1940 in issuing Japanese visas to mainly to that was to the very Poland. story Pritt was talking about, in fact. Yeah, yeah and it's a, it's a terrific story. It's a terrific story. Uh, and that's a sort of a precursor for my story, because the Poles knew about this through the connections to Polish military intelligence. Um, and the first the first passports that they issue in 1941 are actually to people, you know, telling them to to, to go the same route as Sugihara was doing, which was to set, send them across the um, the Soviet Union on the Trans-Siberian Railway and then into Japan, the other side. Um, obviously, Barbarossa makes that impossible fairly swiftly. But that was that was the sort of precursor that sort of planted the idea. And then, of course, after Barbarossa, with this sort of, you know, really intensification of the, of the Holocaust procedures, that sort of, that phase of, of really quite wild sort of mass Einsatz group and killings in the, on the Eastern Front, where the, the Western world gradually gets to know that actually this is a, this is a genocidal program that's going on. Um, that's where it sort of kicks on into a, into a much more sort of systematized and, uh, and, uh, and consequential effort. And the reason for Paraguay is that they, they would have known that there, there was an honorary consul in, in Bern, in Switzerland, uh, who represented Paraguay. His name was Rudolf Hugli. Now, he was a Swiss. He was a Swiss um, lawyer um, because Paraguay didn't have any formal representation in Switzerland at the time. So they used these honorary consuls. He was one. Um, and he was basically, they knew within diplomatic circles, because he'd done it before, 
that he was quite open to the odd bribe. So this chap they approached and they said, you know, could you supply us with some with some Paraguayan passports for a fee? So he was paid quite handsomely for the first batch of Paraguayan passports. To be fair to Hughley, he's not he's not necessarily just a sort of a venal individual. Um, he was a, a very devout Christian and he was sort of he'd wrestled with the whole thing about, you know, the, his duty as the honorary consul versus, you know, um, providing these passports. But he said he, he assuaged his own conscience by by this sort of Christian aspect, saying that, you know, there are people in need and I'm helping them and so on. Um, so anyway, he supplies these Paraguayan passports, which are then sent back to the embassy, are filled out, um, sent back to Hugli to be signed and sealed in the usual way. So actually, they're not really forgeries in that sense. That's sort of shorthand in the title. They're sort of, yeah. we could say they're illegally issued because they're they're issued in the usual way. It's just that the individuals who are receiving them are not Paraguayans and everyone knows they're not Paraguayans. Um, so then there's then they are... Um, a, 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 a notarized copy is made of the document, which is, and then it's that copy that's sent into occupied Poland, right? Um, and as I said before, it basically this enables the recipient to sort of uh, hold up this spurious document and say when they're about to be deported or whatever's going to happen to them, you can't do this to me. I'm a Paraguayan citizen, and it sounds ridiculous to our to our modern ears because how how does that stop the Holocaust in its tracks? Well, it, weirdly, it does because. As I mentioned, the, the, one of the important preconditions for the killing of the Holocaust was the was the uh, uh, say dehumanization. But you make the individuals into non people, right? They have no rights. They have no legal representation. They have no nationality. Their national the, the nationality they can draw on. Um, they they have as literally no avenue that they could exploit to try and save their own lives, and that's engineered by. The, you know the, what the Nazis have done up to that point, so this basically puts a, a spanner in those works, and the result was, re, you know, astonishingly that those individuals are pulled out of the line for deportation, um, and are sent to uh, concentration camps, still so places like Bergen Belsen, uh, and recategorized as what was known as exchange Jews. So they were held held back by the Germans, with the idea that they could be exchanged for Germans held abroad. And there are many more Germans held abroad by the Allied powers and, and, and neutral powers than were actually than there were Jews in you know in these camps. And they even they reckoned that the Germans reckoned that they they could quite easily pull away about thirty thousand of these exchange Jews for for their own purposes and and leverage them for for Germans abroad. And that's essentially what they did. So they knew it was kind of uh, you know it was a, a bogus operation. But they were happy to play along with it. So that that sort of shows you how it worked. And each time they would go back to Hughley and get a new batch, and then that would be sent through. And that gradually, word got out, you know, in the in the ghettos and the camps of occupied Poland, and they start sending these coded letters. And some of these letters are fantastic. How the how they how how intricate the coding was. Very often using sort of Hebrew phrases and so on, um, and Hebrew words uh, embedded within German or or, or Polish. Um, and they're sort of th then you get people actually applying effectively for these passports and sending these letters to their friends in Switzerland. And then it goes through that whole process. So it's it's a really remarkable story. And it's not one that's really been known about. No, we can talk about how you found it and, and, and why it was was hidden for so long later on. And, you know, it also I think you're you're suggesting as well that it it's taking the German system and working it against itself. You know, we, we know right. that it essentially. In the, uh, the war crimes, it was the Germans' record of their own atrocities that essentially made them was their guilt because it, they, there was yeah. a massive, great paper trail behind everything. And as we know, for people who followed this channel, your work is the system, as you've talked about, has been going on since the early 1930s of gradually finding categories. And you're now part of this category, and you're now part of this, and so making people non humans. And so the system is in place, the, the system is there. Um, like those machines that sort that sort wheat coming off the, the mm. I, I spent my summer on a farm for a week, folks. So I mean, it's in my mind there. But you know, the different size things drop through, and and the Jews and the victims of the Holocaust were the ones left after everybody else had been kind of, you're German, you're this, you're that, and everybody else is now non-human. Therefore, you off off to your death. And this is taking yeah. advantage in a sense of that system by using yeah. the paperwork, which is intriguing. That's right. I mean, that that initial example I gave about uh, Sugihara in Lithuania, that they didn't play that game. So he's he's issuing legitimate visas for 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 illegitimate 
purposes, but still legitimate visas, and sort of using the bureaucracy in the in the conventional manner. But what it showed an example of what was possible, because the, the sort of spurious bit of that was they were sending people to Curacao, of all places, right. Right, in the Caribbean. So he'd collaborated with the Dutch consul as well. Um, so that that example sort of showed that idea of of using semi legitimate bureaucracy uh, against that against the regime, and that's what the the Wadosh group then sort of pick up and run with when they when they develop this idea of using Paraguayan passports. Wow. And Bruce Day puts an interesting question about so a, par a foreign passport makes these people traceable. Is that part of it? They they are then there's a paper trail behind, them, albeit a fake paper trail but there, there is nevertheless a there's someone has signed it someone has stamped it so therefore you can't that person can't just disappear without there theoretically being theoretically being, um yeah an investigation yeah, is that, 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 that's right that's right sort of theoret theoretically in that sense that um the other jews around them for example that didn't have those paraguayan passports don't have anything. So there's nobody right. to speak up for them. There's nobody who is possibly going to sort of create a stink at a high level if that person gets killed. So there's that sort of fear in the in on behalf of all of these guards and everybody else in that hierarchy that uh, oh if I you know if I do away with this person then you know might, might create a problem because uh, there is someone actually out there who's looking after this this person. Mm. Right? So there is that element. But the the key thing is I suppose that um for the from the german perspective is that without those passports the the ordinary polish jew is to them just a jew which is which is a worthless human being to their yeah. eyes but somebody with a foreign passport has a value if only because you can exchange them for a german right? mm. it's, it's, mm. at, at heart it's as simple as that Wow, that's a, that's a that's a fascinating way you're putting it. But the next question I'm going to bring up to is is the motivation behind the people who are setting up this system? Because you know that that you know you're you're putting yourself at risk uh, on some level. And as you said there, I like the way you said at the beginning, the relatively safe Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Because I've been threatening for a long time to do a week on this channel about the status of neutral countries and exactly yeah. how neutral neutral is. And when you look at Switzerland and Sweden and Spain and uh, it's very complicated exactly classifying what neutral means. Um, but the, the people, you know, you said diplomats, you said, who are these people and what fundamentally is their motivation for wanting to get to help people? Yeah, well, it's, uh, there, there's, there are others involved on the periphery, but it's reckoned that there's sort of six key members of the Wadosh group. Um, and it's named after Alexander Wadosh, who was the, um, who was the ambassador. Um, and he's a... a larger than life in every way he's a very large plump chap um already at the wrong side of 50 at that time uh in 1940 when he's appointed he had been a had been pursuing a diplomatic career uh in interwar poland and then that had been derailed by the um by the uh rise to power of pilsudski in 1926 because he he was uh, in the opposition to pilsudski so it, uh, perhaps a little unusually he's sort of kind of center left i suppose he's a member of the peasant party so it's sort of center left it's a curious amalgam of sort of social conservatism and um and and left politics so he's a very sort of curious um political case so he fell out with Pulsudski, which meant that his diplomatic career was ended at the, in 1926 effectively and then became a journalist and 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 they sort of rehabilitated in 1939 after ending up you know presenting himself escapes from poland as so many did uh, in 39 and presented himself to the government in exile um, then in in France uh, and said you know I'm willing to serve and they said well great you know and and you're in and we we need ambassadors and you've got you've got um, diplomatic experience and so on so he ends up being sent to Switzerland um, and as we said Switzerland is is a, a very important um, position in in Europe because if you just fast forward a bit to the fall of France Switzerland is an island of sort of democracy and 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 relative freedom and i use that word advisedly uh in a sort of totalitarian sea you bear in mind you've got fascist italy to the south and you've got occupied france and you've got germany to the north so um it really is uh, on its own and that, that this is the reason why we talk about it being a place of relative safety because um it sort of lives a little bit on its wits during the war because it's a, a perennial threat of of some form of occupation or pressure from its totalitarian neighbors and the and the swiss attitude was basically twofold the first one was to arm itself to the teeth 
and to make all sorts of um, you know um, fortifications up in the mountains and that sort of thing, with the express intention of making any invasion of Switzerland as costly in men and material as possible. And then at the same time, to make all the right noises, particularly to the Germans, to say, of course, we won't do anything to upset you. We won't do anything that uh, conflicts with your policy, for example. We won't, we won't uh, you know, tread on your toes in, in this area of policy or that area of policy. So they're being very conciliatory on the one hand and being very defiant and belligerent in the other, which actually works quite well because the Germans don't really want to invade Switzerland. They just they would probably try it if they had plans to do so in the event that they were sort of provoked or whatever. So the Swiss are really on a little bit of a tightrope as well. And that that becomes important because when the, when the Germans begin to know what's going on with the Wadosh group in 42 and 43, um, they start to put, they start, they actually send agents to try and infiltrate the group, for example, which is quite an interesting story. That would, that would feature well in the, in the Spielberg version. Okay. Uh, yeah. Of the film. Um, unsuccessfully. And then, the, and then the other route is just to put pressure on the Swiss and say, look, we know this is going on. We're not entirely sure who's doing it, but we know it's going on. Uh, we want you to shut it down. So they, the, the Gestapo basically pressures the Swiss police to shut the thing down, which they do in 1943. So Switzerland is an interesting case because, you know, we imagine it as this island of freedom and democracy, but it's kind of not really that at all. It's a much more nuanced... Uh, yeah, well, nu nuance context. is the word, isn't it? It's, yeah, you know, you, yeah. you can't really sum up Switzerland's role in a sentence. It, there's, no. there's, I've got, I've got a book on my shelf of a, an American flyer, an eighth Air Force, on, you know, who was shot down there and was put in with murderers and rapists in a prison for two years. And it was, you know, it was awful, you know, and that, that story sits there against this idea of people getting across the border and being, you know, taken to the hotel in, uh, and, and wind and dine. There's all sorts of um, discrepancies yeah. and, and paradoxes in Switzerland there. But, you know, you hinted at it about there, the fact that Germans eventually see what's going on there because I'm, I'm going to kind of liken this to a loophole and the thing about loopholes is loopholes get closed if people find a way of of, of paying a cheap a cheaper electricity bill or something that the electricity company will find and close that loophole and we know that the secret organizations i'm thinking of the various comet line and those things that got allied flyers out of front mm -hmm. Eventually, they got broken because the, the, you know, they, the most of them, you know, most of those covert organisations, at some point in in the Europe, the Germans broke them either by by money or just infiltration or just luck running out. So, but this isn't even hidden. It's it's kind of it's it's in plain sight. Okay, as you said, there these passports are being issued in a kind of fraudulent nature, but they are. There is a passport office. There is someone signing them. So that. The Germans aren't going to put up for this for a long time. So what happened? Well, it, it sort of is and it isn't. Um, the, um, the as I said, it's they're sort of illegally issued or it, 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 yeah, unofficially issued passports. Um, but still, a grey area. Yeah, it's very much a grey area. But there's still a lot of you know, there's a lot of operational security going on um, amongst those in the group, the six members of the group. Um, so much so that actually the the the, um, the Polish government in exile, which is then in London only hears about this operation in 1943 and it actually sends a message back to the, the group in Switzerland to the ambassador and says oh, we've heard that there's this um, possibility of providing Latin America you know false Latin American passports um, to, to help Jews out the Holocaust you know will, will you look into it and he's kind of thinking well this is what I've been doing for three years you know so their operational security was pretty tight really um, and this is one of the problems why the, the the operation was was not really known about got forgotten about after the war because the vast majority of those who received those passports of course they had to survive the holocaust and survive the war that's a, that's a big ask in itself um but the vast majority of them once they've done that you know they don't they didn't even know where those passports had came, come from so that you know if they if they ever got round to surviving and then writing a memoir then this idea of the paraguayan passport or whatever it was um, is just a is just a sort of an open question. You never knew where it came from. It just came from, you know, a friend of ours was a contact in Switzerland, and we don't know where he got it from. So this is partly why the story kind of died on the vine post-war until it was rediscovered in the archive. Um, so that's that's there was very strong sort of operational security around it as well. Um, where it the the other the other aspect is what leading on from your question is that you have to remember that the Germans are basically willing to be complicit in this because it serves them. So they're willing to overlook it. And there's a wonderful document that I quote in the book, which is a memo from the foreign office, 
because there's a great um, conflict actually between the German Foreign Office and the SS, and they're both kind of willing to to go along with this scheme, um, but they're doing it for slightly different reasons. So from the from the SS's perspective, this is all part of the final solution. We're getting rid of the last Jews, and this was a very useful way they saw of sort of fishing out the last fugitive Jews that were living in the underground and living as as sort of uh, as uh, fugitives and so on. Um, so they thought this was a really good way of doing that. And they, with the goal of, you know, a Jew free Europe, as they saw it. And then the Foreign Office is much more rational and saying, well, we can actually leverage these these individuals for the exchange of Germans abroad. Right. Um, so there's a sort of there's a there's a common ground somewhere in that. But there's a very there's a lovely memo which goes from the Foreign Office to the SS, basically saying the principle of getting these people who we can then leverage and use to get Germans back from abroad, that overrides whether these documents are genuine or not. So basically, we don't care if they're faked. We don't care if the individual that's holding it is a Paraguayan or not. We want that person with his document and we want them uh, to, to be ready for exchange for Germans abroad. So they are basically willing to be complicit in the end result of that operation, which is the it's a curiosity. At the same time, they are sending agents to sort of find out what's going on, to try and infiltrate the group and so on, and eventually shut it down. But they, in the short term, they're willing to be complicit in it. So that's a, that's a real mm. peculiarity. And I suppose the Gestapo and the, and the SS, they, they may also have suspicions that this might also connect to something else, in that it, this is a, I'm going to call it a criminal activity because I don't know what else to call it, but mostly they would, a criminal activity has other connections elsewhere. Maybe there's other side operations that that, yeah. that they could they could they could they could they could root out. But yeah. so you talk so about hence, the, hence the reason they shut it down in forty three. Yeah. yeah. So the, so the still, Germans, still, sorry, are, are aware of it and kind of not that they're just aware of it. But what about the Allies? You know, you mentioned the the, 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 the Swiss government next on the UK. So so how aware are the British government, for example, of this going on there? And what do they think about it? Because at the end of the day, if I'm following this correctly, this theoretically could mean that German prisoners from overseas return to Germany, which therefore yeah. means you're adding to Germany's military strength. Mm. Uh, which is another, you know, another interesting area that we don't want Germany, yeah. we want Germany to lose the war. So, what, what do the British government, for example, yeah, think right, about? You're absolutely thing? right. I mean, that, and there are a couple of exchanges done. This is a really interesting part of the story. There are a couple of exchanges that are actually carried out um, with the Americans quite early on. I think in late '41, um, and this is separate from from the Wadosh operation. Um, and what the Germans were doing was sort of collecting up, you know, American Jews who found themselves, you know, on the continent of Europe and fell into their hands through their through their sort of ter territorial conquest of that early phase. And they collect up these Jews and then they, they would swap them for um, uh, German citizens in America. And there are a couple of um, couple of exchanges done. But the problem from the American side was that they were very unhappy with a lot of those individuals that they ended up with. Um, and they would go back to the Germans and say, well, these people don't even speak English. Um, their papers are not in order. They're faked, you know, whatever. Um, they're sort of just posing as Americans. They're not actually Americans. So um, they, the Americans kind of shut this down fairly early on, early on this official um, network. But for the Germans, it, it set a precedent that they saw as a possibility. They saw this as something that they, you know, they could carry on. And if they if they collected up enough of these foreign Jews, as exchange Jews, they could potentially restart that operation in the future. So they carried on doing that. And that's for them, that was the rationale for, for creating that category of exchange Jews and overlooking what people like the Wadosh group were doing. Um, but from the American side, they were, they were kind of burnt by that. So the Americans just saw this as criminal activity, which is really interesting because in 1941, maybe you could say it, it, it's kind of it's a justifiable opinion to say, well, you know, I'm not not we don't yet know exactly what's going on in the Holocaust. And if they're sending us these people who aren't really Americans, then we should just shut that down. Right. So that's maybe a defensible position. But by 1943, when the outside world really does know about what's going on in the Holocaust, at least in its essentials, the Americans are still saying the same thing and they're still mm. saying. You know, we shouldn't allow these people to these people, i.e. the Jews with these foreign passports. We shouldn't allow these people to benefit from illegal activity, which is really kind of, you know, a very sort of punctilious 
a bureaucratic yeah. way of looking at the world, especially when the Holocaust is, is properly up and running in 1943 and the outside world knows it. And they're still saying, no, oh, no, we don't we don't want to reward illegal activity. So there's a really interesting angle here where, you know, as I said before, it's the question of what the outside world knows. And I go into that in the book. And really, from December of 1942, there's no real excuse for the outside world not to know, at least in its essentials, that the Holocaust is going is ongoing. Yeah. Not necessarily the detail of precisely how, but there's enough information to say the Holocaust is ongoing. This is genocide against European Jews being carried out by Germany and its allies. That is clear and known in December 42. So after that point, anyone else just saying, well, we don't, we're not going to help the Jews because this is criminal activity is a really tough position to take. Very punchy. Yeah. But the Americans take it and they're still saying the same thing in 1944. So they end up basically kind of persuading the Latin Americans, particularly the Paraguayans, that, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't pander to this, that we shouldn't recognize those passports. Right. So the Paraguayans under that influence of the State Department basically kind of waver and say and one time they say well we're not going to recognize them and then later on they say they will recognize them of course the germans an exchange jew with a passport that is not going to be recognized is just a jew and we know what they do with jews right so you, this is part of the tragedy of the story is that for those thousands of people who are con confined to places like belson for the second half of the war as exchange jews um because of that diplomatic wrangle that's going on, um, you know, batches of them get sent to Auschwitz and exterminated. I mean, it's it's absolutely tragic. So you, it, it, that element, as I say, what that's why I think that that wider element of the of the political and diplomatic wrangling around this is really really significant. And that's something I think really. I mean, it it it, it injects a real drama into into proceedings. I must say, and that. That, again, that's another aspect that probably work well in the film. Yeah, and I, and I will, you know, address this idea of, of the, of the ten thousand passports and how many survived. You hint, you know, you hinted that that's part of the reason why the story wasn't known. But it, it also just reminds us that diplomacy goes on. You know, that even though the war, the war was, lit, you know, raging on all continents, there are still diplomats from all nations still thinking about alternative solutions and other ways of, of, of bringing resolutions to the situation without conflict. And we, you know, we as Brits, we talk so negatively about Lord Halifax and Neville Chamberlain now, though there has been some reevaluation the last few years about, you know, they were thinking of doing a deal. Well, that's what diplomats do. That's what diplomats yeah. have always, they've always considered. Is there a deal on the table? You know, that's, that's not possible. That's, yeah. That's yeah. That's what diplomacy is. Is there a solution that we haven't found yet? So, but I want to you know explore before we bring this to any of the 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 fate of these people because you said there that some of the ones ended up in Algeria, but, but obviously some others survived. And then and then we had a, Bruce is is representative of several. No, uh, it wasn't Bruce. It was Benjamin Allen said. Uh, how did you, Roger, discover the story? So, so a two-part story is what happened to the people that did survive, and, and in the second part, how Roger did you find the story? Right. Yeah. Um, those that survived, as I said, uh, if you were lucky and you had one of these passports and you got it in, say, you know, 1942 and you got pulled out of a deportation line and you said, you can't do this, submit this to me, I'm a Paraguayan. And they rolled their eyes and they sent you, they sent, you know, we got another one, you know, they'd send you off to basically, they said, sometimes it was Vitell. There were a couple of other places they sent them to. Most of the time they were, they were, the exchange Jews were concentrated at Belson of all places. And I don't need to tell your audience uh what belson means right it's yeah. it's one of the in the, uh, certainly in the in the british historiography of the war it's one of the sort of worst places you could possibly end up um that's largely to do with the circumstances of its of its liberation and the and the collapse in the in the camp's infrastructure at the end of the war you should stress it's not a death camp it often gets described as a death camp because it has such a high death toll um, but it wasn't. It was a, a sort of regular concentration camp. It actually had, you know, many different camps with different differing regimes within it. It's a myriad, you know, hybrid yeah. camp. And one of those regimes was for exchange Jews. And they had they had probably the most uh, easy ride, if it's possibly to say that, say that at all, of any of the prisoners in Belson. So they weren't initially weren't required to work. They could wear their own clothes. They could take you know, their own luggage with them when they went in, for example. So they're under, you know, a mu much more liberal regime than, than ordinary prisoners in Belson. But still, if you are sent there in 1943 as an exchange Jew, uh, 
you then have to survive you know if you're if you're lucky uh you know two years 18 months until the end of the war until the liberation of belson in in uh april of 1945 um to to you know get out of your predicament because there, there, there are very very few exchanges there's one exchange is actually carried out in january of 1945 by the germans um but only literally you know 100 i think 130 are actually exchanged and the vast majority of those that they wanted to exchange at that point were no longer phys physically capable of being exchanged because they were in such a bad state right so you've got that passport you can you know you're a paraguayan citizen you're sent to belson you've then got to survive 18 months two years in belson which is a tough order um the um the problem with most of those as i said is that in that 18 months two year period there's all of that diplomatic wrangling going on as to you know are these passports going to be recognized depends which country you had most of them were paraguayan there's also a sort of lesser category they had these things called promesas which was which was just a, literally a document signed by the honorary consul who said and i recognize this individual as a as a honduran citizen or whatever it is um with no passport no stamps no no details except for the name um and that was very often given out for free um, so there's an open question as to whether these were going to be any use at all. Um, but all of that sort of diplomatic wrangling is going on all the time. The Germans are willing to keep playing the game in the hope that these people might be recognized and can be exchanged. But at the same time, you know, every now and then they they batch up another 2000 individuals and send them to Auschwitz for extermination. And that that's just how it works. So there's a sort of. The, 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 the gruesome machinery of the Holocaust is still looming over them all the way through that 18 month period. And then beyond that, you know, even if it, even if they escape those deportations through good luck or whatever it is, you've still got to survive Belson. And there's outbreaks of dysentery, outbreaks of, of typhus, you know, and um, um, and Frank died in Belson in, in uh, March 1945, for example, of typhus, we reckon. Um, so, you know, it was a gruesome place. The, the conditions there deteriorated from the end of, you know, back end of 44 through to the end of the liberation in April, deteriorated so rapidly and disease is horrific. So the death toll of about, I think from memory, about 55,000, which is big for an ordinary concentration. Yeah, camp, right. Um, so it's really a grim place. So those that 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 this explains that both the twin track, if you like, the one of occasional exterminations by the Germans, and then the second one being, you know, the, the possibility that you won't survive the conditions that you're being held in as an exchange Jew, even if they don't actively kill you, you can still die, you know, because of the because of the conditions in Belson. So for those survivors that did survive, and we know we know of 800 plus that did survive on that on uh, these Wadosh passports, the estimate looking at the sort of st a statistical analysis of the available records suggests that that between two and three thousand might have survived in total um but we know about 800 plus and that you know that's a that's a you know that's a a, a decent return you know on on that, mm. uh, that effort. and why that why the discrepancy you know it, it, would there may have been a point where this individual from warsaw who had been issued a paraguayan passport uh, and they'd arrived at, as you say, Belsi in 1943, but at a certain point, actually the passport was a negative rather than a positive. Maybe people around them saw them in a in a different light, and at some point they would reject it because it, you know, yeah. it's not helping. Is that part of it? For, for a lot of these people, less so the Poles, but more the Dutch, the survival, the survival rate among the Dutch is actually quite a lot higher. Um, and the Dutch were much cleverer. They probably had more resources in the crude sense, but they also had better contacts. Um, so a lot of the Dutch Jews actually had a sort of a suite of survival measures that they that they attempted. So they might have attempted to have one of these passports. So there are contacts between the Wadosh group and the Dutch resistance, for right. example. So, so that explains why a lot of um, Dutch and actually a lot of them are, are German Jews like the Franks, who were German Jews who had escaped to Holland before the war. Right. And then, sort of got, you know, got roped up with Dutch Jews. So that technically they're not Dutch Jews at all. Uh, but anyway, um, so they had contacts with the Dutch resistance. And then and then that's how the contact was made. And from the German perspective, it's interesting. They wanted Dutch Jews to be exchange Jews because to them, the Dutch were effectively like we would call them now clean skins. Right. They didn't yeah. know the chapter and verse and the horror 
of what was going on in the ghettos and the camps of occupied Poland, whereas the Polish Jews did. So there's this point where the German attitude on this shifts, and they say, there's a memo, again, I quote in the book, where they say, um, I think it's early 43, they actually say, we're now prioritizing Western European Jews, particularly Dutch Jews, for the exchange program, because they don't know what's going on. The Polish Jews do, right? So if you're, theoretically, if you're gonna allow these people to survive the Holocaust, you want them to know as little about what has been going on as possible. Mm. And the Poles knew because they're in the eye of the storm. Bear in mind, half of the Jews killed in the Holocaust are Polish Jews, right? The Poles, Polish Jews still in the camps in 43, know exactly what's going on. They are under no illusions whatsoever. Whereas the Dutch Jews, you know, are still in, in comparatively, you know, better conditions. So that, that's an interesting shift. Um, I forgot entirely where I where I where I came to there, Paul. I'm afraid I'm, I think. Well, that, that, I think well, that was that was pretty good. And but the, the next bit yeah. was how did you discover the story? Then we've got a couple. More it? Yeah, it, it sort of it sort of arrived on my on my desk in um, the end of must have been 2018, um, and it was only really discovered in 2017, and it was discovered by the then um, Polish ambassador in Switzerland, a chap called Jakob Kumor. And uh, he was having a reception. I mentioned this. I wrote it in the book and in the um, uh, a sort of prologue. He was holding a reception in his in his um, uh, embassy building. And um, an elderly Jewish chap came up to him and said, um, you know, this this is a holy place. And he said, well, what do you mean? And he's and he said, well, there was a you know, Holocaust a rescue operation was run out of here during the war. And he said, I've never heard of that. Uh, and they, you know, inquired further and, and they got some basic details and he set a member of his staff off to kind of research this. Um, and they they pulled up all of these um, documents from the Swiss archives, the Polish archives and so on. Um, and, it, and this was sort of bubbling under. It had been a couple of, you know, journalistic art, newspaper articles and so on had been written. Um, he wrote a few of them as well, just to sort of flag it up. And then it arrived on my desk from a friend of mine. He said, "This is this is sort of bubbling. This story is bubbling, and it's it's really interesting one. Um, thought you might be interested, sort of thing." And I sort of looked into it and got in touch with them. And I thought, I, and as I said at the top, um, I was then just finishing my my previous book, First to Fight, on the Polish campaign, which I came and spoke spoke with you yeah. about yeah, yeah. a long time ago. Um, so I, I, I was then finishing that off. So I was in that stage where you've got one eye on the current project, which is, you know, in proof form on your desk, and you've got one eye on what you're going to do next. And I thought, actually, that's quite a nice idea. Um, because as I said, I, I like to do something that's new. First of all, I don't want to just rehash, you know, do a history of the Holocaust, because that's been done a 1000 times. So I thought this actually gives me a nice way in with something that's genuinely new, to sort of tell a wider story and, and to look in look at the Holocaust in, in the round. And, and I, I thought this, the more I thought about it, the more I thought this was actually a really good idea. Um, so I got in touch with them and they shared a lot of the research and then I, you know, my job was to put that into a sort of wider context and explain, you know, how it worked, how the Germans viewed it, because they hadn't really looked at the German side of things. They just looked at, uh, at Swiss and Polish documents. So, uh, it, it was just a really interesting story. I thought, and it's got a lot of, there's a lot of what, you know, we can sort of crudely call human interest in there. Yeah, um, it's got lots of, I mean, in my, you know, how I break down my shows on the channel, in my playlist, it's, it, it hits a lot of categories because it yeah, is yeah. a Holocaust story, but it isn't. It's also kind of about, you know, technology in the sense that it's it's using, you know, the, this the scheme of issuing passports. Yeah. It's about Poland. It's about neutrality. It's about lots of things. So it's uh, it covers a lot of area. But an interesting question that I'm going to add anything to, and because you talked about the fact they were, a fish, they were actual passports, but they start getting increased in, in obviously relatively large numbers. So were they were they always official passports or did they actually have to start producing more of them later on? And, 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 and as a follow up to that, what was Paraguay itself thinking? And we could do a whole show yeah. about Paraguay's yeah. politics in the 19th and 20th century, but it's yeah. complicated. But you know, are the Paraguayan government at any point going, hang on, why are we sending you know, hundreds of pa uh, passports a month to uh, to Europe. What what what, are, what what who are all these Paraguayans in need of a new yeah, passport? Why they need them all? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, um, they do use sort of local um, local printers to uh, to produce these, like specialist printers to produce these passports. Um, so they're not all being shipped over from Paraguay in that right. sense. Um, and that's part of what the cost of the you know what the um, the honorary consul uh, has to swallow as part of that cost, I suppose. So, you know, he earns, he's the only one that makes any money out of it at all. So 
um the members of the the, the core members of the group make no money out of it They're, three of them are, are polish one of them's um and the other three technically are polish jews two of them two of whom um are more polish than swiss for example than the other guy um Kaim ice who's the the last example uh, last uh, of the six he was um born in poland and then had, had sort of moved to switzerland as a young man and spent the rest of his life in switzerland so all of them technically are polish jews but there's sort of degrees of shades of nuance within that um or all of them polish to some extent rather um so yeah um hoogley is the only one that actually makes any money out of the, of the whole thing um and he swallows the cost of you know production of the passports as well so that, that they are produced locally but they're still um in the same way as you know were he producing you know ordinary paraguayan passports so that that was as i said they're illegally produced rather than uh, technically forgeries yeah uh, but it, it makes for a good title but i mean and and yeah. my last question will be that these six was has there been any post-war recognition of what they did you know yeah. we know we've gone back and people have you know oscar schindler himself got various uh, recognition did they receive anything have they received anything um only one so that the, the the main the main sort of award or if you like that's that's um uh given for holocaust rescue is is the the type the honorary title of um righteous among the nations yeah which is granted by essentially by yad vashem which is the the israeli holocaust um research institute um and crucially it is awarded only to non-jews non-jews who who help jews survive the holocaust and risk their own lives in doing so um so then given the six that we have which is alexander wadosh stefan rinievich um konstanty rokitsky those are the three who are polish non-jews um those are the only three who would technically be um uh, eligible for the righteous yeah. among nations and of those konstanty rokitsky who is the sort of of the three he's the third in rank and he was the one the vast majority of those passports that that have survived are made out in his hand he has very distinctive handwriting um, and they're made out in his hand. It's quite clear that he did them. Um, and he was recognized as righteous um, in 2019, I think it was, um, which is slightly, I mean, it's very welcome, um, but it's slightly anomalous and confusing because um, the other two were sort of his superiors. And Wadosh himself as, as ambassador, um, you know went into bat with the higher ups you know when he was he was summoned to the foreign ministry he was summoned to the chief of police and so on and he had to defend his operation against the encroachments of the swiss police and you know everyone wanting to shut them down and so on so wadosh although he doesn't necessarily you know fill out the passports himself that's what rokitsky does he's still very closely involved in trying to make this whole thing work right. and to, to enable it to work so i think this this decision although welcome to to honor honor rokitsky um i think it's realistically it must only be a matter of time until rinievich and and alexander wadosh are also honored in the same way because they were also integral in in enabling this whole operation to function in dealing with the sort of the 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 bureaucratic and logistical necessities that made it work so those two i think i mean I, i'm pretty sure there's an application in there at the moment for the other two and i hope that will be um rectified in due course it, it is one of those things that probably i would think be, it would be would be fantastic and yeah. i said we're gonna have well, that was the last question we've actually got an interesting one in from gregory there uh you know you're talking about this potential of the, of, of the people on the paraguayan passports being used in, in exchanges so gregory is asking is, is there any connection with this with the madagascar plan uh no uh sure i do mention the madagascar plan in the book because it's part of that sort of whole um how do we put this it's the it's it's one of the sort of mooted solutions to alternative the alternative solution i suppose maybe. I think, yeah before they get to the final solution yeah. which is extermination but so the madagascar plan is actually quite interesting in that sense um it sort of blossoms as an idea it had been bounced around a bit before the british had thought about it and actually the poles had thought about it as well as a sort of not in the same sense as the nazis did but the poles had thought about it as a as a potential jewish homeland um, for polish jews um and actually sent a commission there in the 1920s to investigate the possibility 
Um, and then, of course, the Nazis get hold of it and they think, well, this is a great idea because, you know, it's 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 shipping the Jews out of Europe, which is what we want. It's shipping them to somewhere which is fundamentally, you know, fairly in, inhospitable. So the vast majority, we can reckon that the vast majority are going to die of natural causes anyway. That was the Nazi logic. So they're basically treating Madagascar kind of, you know, almost like a like a a large scale ghetto in the same sense. Yeah. Right? You, think, you concentrate your enemies in that place. Uh, you make conditions as grim as possible so the vast majority die anyway. And then at some point down the line, you have to deal with the remnant that's left. That's the logic that they're applying in the ghettos of occupied Europe and occupied Poland. And that's the same logic as they were applying in the Madagascar plan. Now, the Madagascar plan kind of blossoms in the summer of 1940 with the fall of France because, you know, it was a French colony. When, for, when France falls, then there's this poss momentary possibility for the Germans that they could they could browbeat the French into giving them Madagascar for these purposes. It then dies a death soon soon after with the failure to defeat Britain because you can't do that. You can't, you know, physically set up this effectively ghetto in the in the Indian Ocean um, while the British are still in the game and the Royal Navy is still in the game. You can't start sending millions of people across, you know, across the seas to to populate this Madagascan ghetto. So is there's a sort of brief brief flowering of the idea in 1940 but as i said it's not it's not meant to be a a, a sort of pleasant humanitarian solution at all the, the logic is extremely brutal uh, yeah. in the german mind as to as to how madagascar was to operate brilliant well we've we've done all the questions so we'll bring things in roger and uh and, and, and basically, thank you very much for talking to us and good luck with the book. And you've explained the reasons uh, you, you, you think the story should be told. It's now down to the punters out there to go and go and buy it and learn themselves an interesting bit of history. And I say it is one of those stories that comes up every now and then on the channel where there's no there's nothing like it that I've ever covered before. It's it's a completely unique story, whereas often we we put the perennial chestnuts of Normandy and Midway. This is this is this is new. So uh, I can't wait to receive my copy and read it myself. So. Thank you, Roger, and have a good uh, rest of the day, and I will look forward to speaking to you in the future. Thanks, Willie. All the best. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all again tomorrow. Remember, tomorrow my show is at 12 p.m. I'm talking to Liz Coward about Shangi Prison over in Singapore. Cheers, everybody. Bye.